Well, today is the last Sunday of our sizzling summer in terms of special speakers. I mean, James River, come on. It's always sizzling, isn't it? Come on. But you know, we have heard from world-class speakers every single week, and it's been amazing. The messages that we've heard, and this morning, we are blessed to have a man who could be anywhere in the world today. Tonight, he's going to be at Lakewood Church in Houston, but this morning, Robert Madu is in the house. So, Robert, come on up. Come on, let's give him a big James River welcome. Robert Madu is coming to bring the word. Hallelujah. Well, come on, if you love Jesus, why don't you give him a big hand clap of praise this morning? Oh, come on, James River, can we lift up the name that is above every single name? Come on, he's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of the Lords. God, we honor you today. Have your way in this place. Amen, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Don't get comfortable. You might be back up again. Come on, somebody. Anybody excited to be in the house of God this morning? I tell you. You look like you've been sizzling all summer. You look like it. And I am, as I always say, Red Bull excited and express so elated to be back uh, at James River Church. I told Pastor John in the back, I will keep coming here till y'all get sick of me coming. I'm telling you. And even when you get sick of me, I'll be holding on signs saying, hey, I will preach for free for food, help a brother out. Because, uh, man, I love this church. I love what God is doing. I don't think there's been a time that I've come and I hadn't heard a testimony or report of how you are expanding, gra grabbing new territory, how God's favor has just been lavished upon you. How many know you're a part of an amazing church? You know that, right? Like, this is, this is extraordinary. It's unbelievable, and I pray you never take for granted what God is doing here, and never take for granted the leaders God has given you to steward this vision. I think they're the best of the best. Come on, they are heroes to my wife and I. They are hashtag goals for us, and I want you to help me thank God. Come on, for Pastor John and Debbie. Y'all are blessed with the most incredible pastors and people on the planet. Come on, can you let them know how much we love them? Come on, across every campus. Come on, let's let them know how much we appreciate you. We thank God for you. Amen. Amen. And God's going to do something awesome in here today. Did you come with some expectation? Come on, I am not here by myself. My wife sends her love. She is with our two kids under two. Uh, but I am here with my father, Robert Madu Sr. My dad is here. It's his first time joining me, so help me thank God for my dad. Amen. You heard me preach before, I say all the time, you know he is the reason that I'm African-American. <laughs> like for real, like for real. He, he's from Nigeria. He came to America, like Eddie Murphy in the movie, and uh, <laughs> met my mom who's American, which is why I am African-American. Y'all a smart class, I'm telling you. I'm African-American. And shout out all the people watching online on West Campus. Hey, I'm excited about this word. I want to jump straight into it. Do you have a Bible with you? Come on, if you got a Bible, wave it in the air like you just do care. Awesome. Some of your Bibles are glowing. Amen. Charged up your Bible last night. I, I want to look at two passages of Scripture today. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, and also Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 3, 13 through 17, and Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Once you have it, why don't you say, yeah? yeah. If you're still looking for it, say, hold on. But right, I'll wait for you. I'll give you some time. And look what it says. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. You're coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That's exactly how God sounded that day, by the way. You're, you're welcome. 
Uh, in the next passage, I want to look at Matthew 4, 1 through 11. And it says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted, whoo, 40 days, 40 days and 40 nights. How many thankful we're doing a Daniel fast for 21 and not 40? Come on now. <laughs> 40 days and 40 nights. That's a, that's a long fast. It's a long fast. And I love when the Bible is just blatantly obvious. It says, after the 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I bet he was. <laughs> <laughs> and it says, now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Can you say amen? amen. This morning, I, I want to preach, not long, probably about six and a half hours, <laughs> just from this thought, the water and the wilderness, the water and and the wilderness. Would you help me preach and just look at your neighbor, get in their face, get in their personal space, and just say, neighbor, it's about the water and the wilderness. Come on, find you another neighbor in case that one was stuck up. Come on, find you <laughs> another neighbor. Come on, look at somebody else. Say, other neighbor, you're my second option. <laughs> but I want you to know it's about the water and the wilderness. Come on, if you believe God's going to speak to you today, would you give him some praise up in here? Woo. Hallelujah. Come on, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I know the grass withers, the flower fades, but it's your word that shall stand forever. Holy Spirit, speak to us today so clearly, so powerfully that when we leave here, we'll say it was so good to have been in the presence of the Lord. And somebody who loves Jesus, say amen. Amen. Say amen again. Amen. James River Church, this year I will celebrate and commemorate 12 years of full-time ministry. 12 years of full-time ministry. For the last 12 years, I've had the incredible privilege and opportunity to travel around the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ for 12 years. Now, it's hard for me to believe that it's been 12 years because I started coming to my church in Dallas when I was just three years old. I preached my first sermon when I was 16, scrawny, single, and still living at home with my parents. Now I am happily married, 32, got two kids under two, one mortgage, six chest hairs. I'm a grown man now. Things have changed. <laughs> And in my 12 years of traveling, there, there's a question that I'm often asked on the road, and it is a question that is based on an assumption. And it generally happens on a Sunday like this when I'm traveling with my father. Somebody will inevitably come up to me and say, Robert, how long has your father been pastoring? Or Robert, how long has your dad been preaching? And to their shock, I have to tell them, my dad is actually not a pastor. My dad is a firefighter. For the last 30 years, my father, Robert Madu Sr., has been fighting fires for the city of Dallas. 30 years. Shout out to all the firemen. Come on, all the officers, all those who serve. Come on, let's make some noise for them. That's what I'm talking about. Give honor to where honor is due. Thank you for your sacrifice. Amen. 30 years firefighter, Robert Madu Sr. Now, my father and I, we have the same name, different vocations. Ooh. Same name, different callings. But that is really imperative for you to note this morning because in the unlikely event that your house should catch on fire, and, and for whatever reason you were to be trapped inside of that house that caught on fire, and for whatever reason you could only call one Robert Madu to get you out. Ooh. 
make sure you call the right one, okay? Make sure you call the right one. Now, don't get me wrong. Both of us will want to see you get saved. <laughs> like, neither one of us wants you to experience the flames. Some of you get that tomorrow. However, <laughs> how we accomplish that objective will be totally different, okay? My father, Robert Madu Sr., who's the fireman, he is going to grab a fire truck and a ladder and go into the house on fire, and he is going to rescue you from the flames. My approach is going to be a little bit different, okay? I'm just going to grab a microphone, and uh, I'm going to stand, out, stand outside a considerable distance away from you that's trapped in the fire, and I'm just going to encourage you and say something like, consider it pure joy, my brother. Whenever you face various trials, uh, knowing that the testing of your faith uh, produces perseverance, uh, I know you're in the fire right now, uh, but you're coming out uh, as pure God. Old, because no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. Hey, you're not the only one that's ever been stuck in a fire. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were in the fire too. But if God got them out, he, I said he, not me, but he, will get you out too. <laughs> that is a true story, people. I am a preacher, not a firefighter. But, but in all seriousness, some of my greatest memories as a child is when I would go visit my dad when he was working at the fire station. As a young boy, I'd visit my dad at the fire station. You got to understand, a fire station to a young boy is absolutely amazing. People, it's like Disneyland without the ticket prices. It is Legoland without the lines. I remember running around the fire station as a kid, and I'm trying on the uniform. I'm pretend driving the fire truck and hitting the siren. My friends at school would be like, hey, Robert, I got a new fire truck for Christmas. I'm like, that's cute. I drive one. Hashtag dream bigger. And uh, <laughs> some awesome memories. But I will never forget, I will never forget one day as a kid, I'm visiting my dad at the fire station, pretend driving the fire truck, and all of a sudden, without warning, I hear on the intercom, engine 26, five alarm fire, engine 26, five alarm fire. And immediately, my father went from laughing at me, pretend driving the truck, to saying in his Nigerian voice, son, get up now. He picks me up, throws me out of the fire seat to my mom. All of a sudden, firemen started coming out of the crevices and the corridors of the fire station like ants escaping an ant bed that had just been stepped on. I saw two firemen that were playing ping pong. They threw the paddles in the air and started putting on their gear. One fireman was eating a turkey sandwich. He stopped mid bite and jumped on the truck, and in no less than three minutes, the same fire truck I was pretend driving was now racing out of the parking lot, and the same siren I was pushing for my entertainment was now being pushed for an emergency because time was of the essence and destiny was on the line. And I will never forget the look on my father's face and the immediacy of the moment as he had to quickly transition from a moment of fellowship with his son to now racing to put out a fire that he didn't start. I, I share my childhood experience with you today in a feeble attempt to accurately articulate what is happening in Matthew chapter 3 with Jesus' baptism and Matthew chapter 4 with Jesus' temptation. Because in Matthew chapter 3, he is enjoying the fellowship with his father, but in Matthew chapter 4, he is racing to a five-alarm fire. And I need you to feel the whiplash of our Savior as he has to make this transition from Matthew chapter 3 to Matthew chapter 4. Let me parenthetically pause here and explain something about the Bible that we hold. How you know there was a time where there were no chapter verses and chapter numbers in your Bible. And although the chapter numbers and verses are helpful, sometimes they can be a hindrance in you really getting the context of the text that you're reading. So if you're not careful with our text today, you'll do what I've done for years, which is to read about Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3, pause for a commercial and coffee break, and then read about his temptation in Matthew chapter 4. And you will look at them as isolated, independent events. But I submit to you today that these are not isolated, independent events. These are events that have to be looked at interdependently because they give us insight as to what the life of a believer looks like and gives us biblical blues clues as to what happens when you are on the journey to become who God has called you to be. I'm just telling you today that there is a connection between what 
what happened in the water and what happened in the wilderness. Maybe I read the wrong scripture this morning, and I shouldn't have read Matthew's account. I should have read Mark's account, because look at how Mark puts it in Mark chapter 1. He says, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan, and immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately, immediately, no chapter break, Mark says immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with wild beasts. Immediately he goes from the water to the wilderness. See, it's that immediately that irritated me, because I'm trying to figure out how one moment he's being baptized, the next moment he's in a battle. One moment he's in total community, the next moment he is in isolation. One moment he hears a voice from heaven, the next moment moment he hears the voice from hell. One moment he's getting a word in the water, the next moment he's in warfare in the wilderness. Some of you have been where Jesus has been, where one Sunday you're experiencing the power of God, but on Monday it's like the enemy attacks the same thing you experienced on Sunday. All of a sudden you're simmering and sizzling this summer, but all of a sudden in the fall it's like the enemy comes to take all of your sizzle and have you simmering. Does anybody know what it's like to transition? from the water to the wilderness. That's where the tension is in the transition from the water to the wilderness. Why is it on the pathway to your purpose, on the route to your destiny, that the GPS system, ooh, God's positioning system, always tells you start on water road and then make a sharp right turn into the wilderness the water and the wilderness. Before I talk about the wilderness, I really want to spend some time talking about the water. And I need you to understand this morning that Jesus' baptism was a big deal. How many of you know it was a big deal? This is an epic moment. This is like that scene at the beginning of the movie that if you missed because you were putting some extra butter on your popcorn, you may as well just go home and wait for it to come out on Netflix because you will be confused the entire movie. His baptism was a big deal. I find it intriguing that only two of the four gospel writers feel the need to talk about Jesus' birth. Only two of the four gospel writers talk about Jesus' birth. That's Matthew and Luke. Mark and John don't even discuss Jesus' birth. Come on, you know you're gangster when you skip Christmas, okay? They just don't even discuss his birth, but yet all four gospel writers felt it was incumbent upon them to talk about his baptism and his temptation. All of them talk about what happened in the water. Jesus' baptism was a big deal. I know his baptism was a big deal because the Bible says when he got baptized, immediately the heavens opened up. Immediately the the heavens opened up. You know when the heavens open up, something is about to happen. Something is about to shift whenever the heavens open up. Whenever the heavens open up, an announcement is about to be made. How many of you gathered this Sunday morning because you want to see the heavens open up over your life? Come on, over what God has for you? Something happens when the heavens begin to open up. Y'all do know the next time the heavens open up, a trumpet is going to sound and we are going to be caught up to meet our Lord and our Savior because this earth isn't our home. Heaven is our real home. Something happens when the heavens open up. I'm telling you, I know Jesus' baptism was a big deal because of who showed up at the baptism. For the first and only time in all of Scripture, the entire Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, make a cameo appearance at the exact same time because you got God the Father making a declaration in heaven. You have God the Son in the water, and you got God the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. Come on, you know when the whole Trinity shows up, something is about to happen. Jesus' baptism was a big deal. Oh, I know his baptism Baptism was a big deal because of what the Father was declaring over the Son. The Father was declaring something that every human heart wants to know. The Father was declaring a transcendent truth that has to be the anchor in your soul whenever the enemy comes against you. The Father was declaring something that you have to know that you know that you know. And that truth is this, I am loved, I am a child of God, and He is pleased with me. I am loved, I am a child of God, and He is pleased with me. I am loved. I am a child of God, and he is pleased with me. Oh, y'all going to make me say it by myself. Come on, I want to interrupt this regularly scheduled sermon so you can engage in a verbal exercise. Would you just declare this? Say, I am loved. I am a child of God, and he is pleased with me. Say it like you believe that thing. Say, I am loved. I am a child of God, and he is pleased with me. 
How many know that is some good news right there? If that got in your heart, it would change the way you hold up your head. It would change the way you walk in a room to know that you are loved, you are a child of God, and he is pleased with you. I dare you, every morning you get up, before you brush your teeth, you ought to just look at yourself in the mirror and preach to yourself with your stanky breath and just say, I am loved, I am a child of God, and he is pleased with me. If you're considering getting a face tattoo, I wouldn't, but if you still want to, I know what you should put on your forehead. Put, I am loved, I am a child of God, and he is pleased with me. Next time you go to Starbucks and they say, what name should I put on the drink? You ought to tell them, I am loved, I am a child of God, and he is pleased with me. Come on, somebody give God some praise. If you know that is good news. Woo! I'm loved. I'm a child of God and he's pleased me. What if you filtered every comment, every circumstance in your life through that transcendent truth? Woo! What if you one time just cut off your smart device that's making you stupid and because you didn't get the likes you wanted on Instagram or Facebook, just declare to yourself, I'm not living for likes. I am loved. I am a child of God and he is pleased with me. That truth will change your life forever. And that's where most believers stop. They stop right at the water experience because the water is all about your identity. The water experience is about you knowing who you are and whose you are. Understand that the father made this declaration over the son before he did a miracle. He hadn't done anything yet. He hadn't moonwalked on water. He hadn't taken the two fish and five loaves and made the first red lobster. He hadn't healed anybody yet. And yet the father is still saying, you are loved, you are my son, and I am pleased with you. How? He hadn't done anything. I know because it has nothing to do with performance, everything to do with his proximity, that he is my child. You are loved, and I am pleased with you. And that's where most believers stop. They're like, whoo, I'm loved. I'm a child of God, and he's pleased with me. We stop at the water. But I feel the need to warn you that right after the water, you're going to walk into the wilderness. Right after you hear the voice of heaven, hear me, you will hear the voice from hell. And it messes believers up because we think after we've gotten the approval of heaven, we shouldn't have an attack from the enemy. Th that's what messes up a lot of us believers because we think that the approval of heaven absolves us from the attack of the enemy. So you have believers that are confused and as a consequence we have relegated the approval of God to a better house, a better job, a better car, and it's all about blessing. And don't get me wrong, I believe God wants you to be blessed. Come on, how many know God wants you to be blessed? He wants you to be blessed. I don't think he wants you to have enough. I think he wants you to have more than enough. But the life of Jesus is proof positive that the approval of heaven does not absolve you from the attack from the enemy. As a matter of fact, hear me, for many of you, the reason you're facing the battle you're facing right now is simply because God is pleased with you. That's why you're facing the attack, because God is pleased with you. You understand, it is the smile of heaven that attracts the scowl of hell. Ooh, come on, that'll tweet. <laughs> it is the smile of heaven that attracts the scowl of hell. So once you got the smile from heaven, don't be shocked or surprised when you get the scowl and have to go from the water to the wilderness. I'll be honest with you, I don't like this transition of the water to the wilderness. I think we should have our water experience in the wilderness. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think this text would read a whole lot better if it started off in the wilderness and a Satan comes up on Jesus and declares, if you are the Son of God, then let the voice from heaven come and interrupt Satan mid sentence and go, what do you mean if he's the Son of God? He is the Son of God. And I already declared to Satan, you know what, Satan? You better put some respect on Jesus' name. You better put some respect on his name. You know what? I, I wish God was just going to let there be water in the middle of the wilderness and then all of a sudden a pool of water shows up and the entire Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit takes Satan by the neck and just starts drowning him in the water. Tell me, what you mean if he is the Son? I wish you would say if one more time and just choke him to death. And then once the enemy's lifeless body is floating in the water, then you call John the Baptist and say, we're ready for the baptism now. <laughs> I just think it would read better like that, but it's not the way it works. God will not give you the water in the wilderness. He always takes you from the water to the wilderness. The water 
to the wilderness, the water to the wilderness, the water to the wilderness, the water to the wilderness, the water to, the, I'm going to say it till you hear my voice tomorrow morning, the water to the wilderness, the water to the wilderness. I find it intriguing. They didn't even know what I was preaching, but do you know what's behind me? Some water and some wilderness, the water and the wilderness, the water and the wilderness. This is God's system. This is how he works. He takes us from the water to the wilderness. You do know that John the Baptist baptized people in the But when they asked John who he was, he said, I am a voice crying out in the crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. What is the way of the Lord? He takes you from the water to the wilderness, the water to the wilderness, the water to the, oh, now I see why the children of Israel had to go through the Red Sea. Because you know the Red Sea is composed of and they had to go through the water because the water is about your identity and Pharaoh thought they were just slaves but no Pharaoh they are not slaves they are my children they are loved and I am pleased with them and there is no stronghold that can hold them down they must be set free and right after they went through the water they didn't go to the promised land they walked straight into the wilderness they were in the wilderness 40 years Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days, and there's always this transition in life from the water to the wilderness. You know what? I might be bringing my own presupposition to this biblical passage, but I told you earlier, I have two kids under two. (laughs) Pray for your boy. And uh, (laughs) because I do have two kids under two, their birth is not too distant of a memory to me. And I submit to you that even the way we enter the earth is just a microcosm and a mirror of this transcendent truth of going from the water to the wilderness. Oh, come on. You remember how you were born, right? You remember how you were conceived? You were conceived in your mother's womb, right? Identity confirmed in the womb. We're having a boy. We're having a girl. And you remember when you were in your mother's womb, you were surrounded by... So much so that when your head got too big and your birth was imminent, your mama looked over the dining room table and said, "Uh uh-oh, my water just broke. And do you remember your first birthday? Do you remember what happened when you first entered the earth? Do you remember how you came in the earth? Did you come in dancing? No. Did you come in laughing? No. Did you come in singing? No. Did you come in rapping? Started from the belly, now I'm here. No, no, no. Do you remember? You remember how you came in the earth? This is how you came in the earth. Isn't it funny? Us newborn parents look at a baby screaming and crying, going, hey, <laughs> welcome to the earth, little one. And they look at us talking about, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I am convinced if you could translate the cry of a newborn baby, the caption would read, what you mean, welcome to the world? <laughs> Don't you mean, welcome to the You spend all of your life grappling with the complexity of the wilderness that you were born into. I've learned to be quick to love, not quick to judge, because you don't know the wilderness that some people were born into. Surrounded by the wilderness, I need you to see today that the same spirit that descended on Jesus in the water is the same spirit that led him into the wilderness. It's the same spirit. So this is not necessarily about the wilderness as much as it is about who was waiting in the wilderness. This is about the enemy. This is about Satan who was waiting in the wilderness for Jesus. Waiting and didn't clear his throat until after he had fasted 40 days. He was just there waiting, watching. That's how the enemy does. He waits, he watches, then he attacks. He was just waiting in the wilderness. Didn't even say anything, just watching Jesus. Hmm, 15 day fast. Oh, 25 days on the fast. You are the son of God. Go, Jesus. Go, Jesus. Go. Oh, 40-day fast. Oh, you're done fasting? Now I'll attack. Why don't you turn these stones into cornbread? (laughs) Right after, just watching and waiting. That's how he does to you. He's just watching and waiting, looking for the opportunity to attack you, just watching and waiting for a moment to come against you. It's so funny, I was watching a a Discovery Channel once and they did a special on snakes. And I almost changed the channel because I don't do snakes. But, But I'm glad I didn't because they told me that snakes, I'll never forget it, are one of the only animals, watch this, that don't blink. This, 
is a snake. <laughs> People, they don't blink. Just watching, waiting for a moment to attack at the right time. Oh, I watched another special they did on snakes. And they talked about a lady who had a pet snake. A pet snake. A pet snake. The animal that Satan chose to manifest through. This was her pet. And she encountered a problem because her pet refused to eat. Stop eating. So she took her snake to the veterinarian. She said, something's going on. I would feed it rats. At one point it would eat. But for the last few months, my snake is not eating. The veterinarian says, really? Looks at the snake. Looks at the woman. She says, ma'am, can I ask you something? By any chance, have you been sleeping with your snake? The lady goes, well, yeah, I have. She said, the snake's not poisonous. He's a python, but he's not poisonous, and his cage is right next to my bed. So sometimes I let him slither out and just kind of curl up next to me when I sleep at night. The veterinarian said, okay. Another question, ma'am, as you've been sleeping with your snake, have you ever woken up in the morning to your snake stretched out beside you? The lady goes, yes. As a matter of fact, this morning I woke up, and the snake was stretched out right next to me. The veterinarian says, hmm. She says, ma'am, I have some good news, and I have some bad news. She says, the good news is your snake is not sick. She goes, oh, thank you, Jesus. She goes, the bad news is your snake is not eating because it's preparing to eat you. She goes, yes. She says, the reason your snake refuses to eat is because it's preparing its digestive system to swallow you. She said, the reason you wake up to your snake stretched out beside you is because your snake is sizing you up and is trying to see how big it needs to get to swallow you whole. The lady goes, really? <laughs> And I think that's how some believers act as it relates to the enemy. And you're totally oblivious to the fact that God is not, that the enemy is not happy with what God is doing in you and through you. And he's trying to destroy everything that God wants to manifest in your life. But how many are thankful that the enemy can keep on watching? But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Oh. Here's the challenge of life, is how are you going to handle the temptations of the wilderness after your water experience? How are you going to handle the temptations of your wilderness? Some of you are like, Robert, how dare you ask us such a question? I mean, I've been coming to this church for years. I'm very spiritual. I floated in here today. I had communion and manna for breakfast. What do you mean, temptations of my wilderness? I, I'm in church today. I know, but this is the water. <laughs> Tomorrow you're going to work. That's the wilderness. I want to talk to some young people who's so excited because God did awesome things in your life this summer, and you're jumping up and down, and you're dancing, and you're dabbing, and you're so excited about it. But can I tell you, in a few weeks when school starts, you are walking right back into the wilderness. How are you going to win the war in the wilderness? All that was my introduction. <laughs> I'm going to give you four very quick points to show you how to win the war, things you must know in the wilderness. Number one, you must know where you are where you are. Where are you? I need you to see that this is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist has just announced that he is the Son of God, and right after that announcement, right after his inauguration, comes temptation. The enemy is trying to stop him before he ever gets started. You know you're going to face a battle when you're at the beginning of something. Anytime you get ready to start something, expect an attack. Starting a family, expect an attack. Starting a business, expect an attack. The enemy wants to kill you before you ever get started. Some of you wonder why you grew up in such a hellacious environment. It's because the enemy knows what God was going to do in you and through you, and he tried to destroy you. Come on, somebody knows what I'm talking about. He tried to destroy you before you ever got started. He attacks at the beginning. You must know where you are. I believe that Satan was attacking Jesus throughout his ministry, but there were times that the attack was more intense. It's intense right here at the beginning. I think that the attack was more intense in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's wrestling with the will of the Father, and you can hear, almost hear the enemy breathing down his neck, going, you're going to go to the cross for all of them, and they might not even accept you. And here is Jesus wrestling in the Garden of Gethsemane to the point he's sweating blood because the attack of the enemy is strong in that season. He did it again when he was on the cross, this time through a person, saying, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Where are you? If you don't know where you are, you will not know your pathway to victory. How many know all wildernesses are not created equal? 
Come on, what tempts you does not tempt me. What tempts that person does not tempt this person. Your temptation comes in different seasons of your life. How many know what tempts you at 13 is not what tempts you at 30? Come on, what, what tempts you when you're single is not what tempts you when you're married. Come on, when I was dating my wife and we were just dating, I had strong temptation. The temptation was to be a man of God and to be pure. And my wife is fine. It was strong temptation. <laughs> that was the temptation when I was single. Now that I'm married, come on, that ain't the temptation now. I am married. Hello, somebody. Now the temptation is just to have a date night in the first place with two kids under two who are assaulting my sleep every day. <laughs> know where you are. If you don't know where you are, you won't know your pathway to victory. Number two. You must know the Word is your weapon. Ooh, the Word is your weapon. With every attack of the enemy, what was Jesus' response? It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. Not it is tweeted. Not it is hashtagged. Not it is, oh, it's in a sermon that Pastor John preached like six weeks ago. Hold on, let me download the podcast. No, no, no. It is written. It has to be the Word that is in you. The Word is your weapon against the attack of the enemy. Come on, somebody. Your Word is your weapon. You got to start using that weapon. I find it intriguing that in the water, the word comes over you. In the wilderness, the word's got to come out of you. It's got to come out of you. And if it's not in you, you will not have an attack to fight against the enemy. You tackle temptation with the truth of God. People erroneously uh, quote John chapter 8, verse 32, and they say the truth will set you free. Uh, the truth will not set you free. The truth will not set you free. That verse says you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The only truth that will set you free is the truth that you know. If you don't know it, you won't have anything to come back against the enemy. I, I think the best way to illustrate this is, I'll never forget when I was in Israel and had a, a conversation with a camel. Had a good conversation with a camel. I think they have a picture of it. And uh, <laughs> had a great conversation with this camel, and I was talking to this camel about how in the world he survives in the wilderness that he lives. I'm like, yo, camel, you live in hot, arid conditions. How do you survive? And the camel said something very interesting to me. He said, Robert, whenever I sit down to eat, he said, I am able to ingest large amounts of water and vegetation at one sitting. He said, I'm able to ingest so much that I can even store it, which is the humps on my back you were riding on. So he says, because I'm able to ingest large amounts of water and vegetation, he says, as I'm traveling through the wilderness, it doesn't matter how how hot the external conditions are, all I have to do is reach back and pull from all the water and all the vegetation that I stored when I took the time to sit down and take in that which would nourish me. And as I pull back from what I have, it sustains me in the midst of the wilderness. Come on, that's a picture of a believer. That's why every morning you get up, you got to feed on the Word of God because when you step in the wilderness, you'll have something to pull back from. The Word is your weapon. Number three. You must know what is at stake. What is at stake? Can I tell you, church, can I tell you why I love Jesus? There's so many reasons I love him. But one reason I love Jesus is because he made decisions with my destiny in mind. He made decisions with all of humanity's destiny in his mind. And most people think he just did it on the cross and getting up from the grave. But I submit to you, your Savior was thinking about you in the water and in the wilderness. He was thinking about you in the water. Here's how I know. I was reading this text and I go, wait a minute. Why is Jesus being baptized? Why in the world is the Son of God taking time to be baptized? You do know what baptism is, right? Baptism is an external representation of an internal commitment, saying that when I go in this water, the old me is gone and dead, and when I come out of the water, I am resurrected with Christ, and the new me is coming up, ready to step into all that God has for me. Why in the world is Jesus being baptized? This is the spotless, sinless Lamb of God. There's no old him to go down in the water. He is perfection. Why is he being baptized? I love it because it's some frustration with John because John comes up to, when Jesus comes up to John, he's like, wait, wait a minute, you, you should baptize me. Why, why do you want me to baptize you? That's why John is so confused. Come on, this baptism makes no sense. This is Steph Curry asking you for three-point shooting tips. Come on, this is Adele asking you for voice lessons. Come on, this is Donald Trump asking you for spray tanning tips. This doesn't make sense. Like, why is he asking Jesus to baptize him? Then it's in what Jesus says. Understand, he said this, we ought to do this to fulfill all righteousness. 
You understand, Jesus did not come just to die the death we were supposed to die. He came to live the life we were supposed to live. So he says, John, this is all about my obedience and for those who are coming after me. He says, John, I know you're tripping about it because I created you and I even created the water you're about to put me in, but we have to do this because this is not about me. This is about those that are coming after me that they can have hope and know that you don't have to be stuck in your condition of sin. Come on, somebody, that there is hope, that there can be a knew you, so I have to be obedient even while I'm in this water. He was obedient in the wilderness. You understand that if Jesus turned those stones into bread and ate the bread, he would have been no different than Adam that gave in to the temptation when he ate from the tree. Jesus had to win that battle in the wilderness so that we could have hope that no matter what the enemy is launching against us, how many know we're not fighting for victory, we're fighting from victory because Jesus Christ already won it when he was obedient in his life and in his death. That's good news. Know what's at stake. Hear me, you can face your temptation when you know what's at stake. How many of you know you have to win the war in your wilderness because it's not just about you. It's about your children and your children's children's children. Your legacy is on the line. You have to win the war in the wilderness. Number four, not only do you have to know where you are, not only do you have to know that the word is your weapon and what's at stake, but you know, must know where your help comes from. You have to know where your help comes from. The Bible says that after the enemy stopped all his temptation, that angels came and ministered to Jesus in the midst of that wilderness. How many know if Jesus needed some ministering to after his fight in the wilderness, how much more do we need some help in the wilderness that we're facing? And you know the way you get some help is when you look up to the hill from where your help comes from and you say God I need you I cannot do this in my own strength and how many are thankful that if you resist the enemy he will flee and God will come in and give you some angelic assistance oh come on somebody is there anybody in here today that knows where your help comes from that knows that God is your redeemer he is your protector he is your provider he's not going to leave you by yourself you got some help Oh, come on, would you just get up on your feet and lift up your hands and just begin to thank him for where your help comes from? Come on, his name is victory. God, thank you that your victory is our victory. Come on, let's give him some praise in this place today.